they bet him a bunch of money that he couldn't shave for like three months. And he had this like long beard. It was so gross, but no mustache at all. Hello, everybody, and welcome into the call up. We are getting closer and closer to real soccer. And with that, Susanna Collins and I had a very special guest today, Sasha Question. He talks about playing El Trafico for the first time in Orlando. That time, Jesse Marsh and his family bunked up with him and an emotional conversation about taking his family to a Black Lives Matter protest and what he wants to see as MLS returns to play. And the MLS is back tournament in Orlando. I'm telling you, I learned so much from Sasha. I thought this was this was a really incredible conversation. It was good for the soul, and I think it was good for my MLS brain as well. Yeah, I mean, he is such a thoughtful, cerebral guy. And, you know, in addition to obviously talking about soccer coming back, I think, you know, one of the takeaways I – had from this conversation is that, you know, the conversations about Black Lives Matter and though his support, you know, this needs to be an ongoing conversation. And I think he's one of the guys that's really going to keep that conversation in the forefront. So um, yeah, you guys are going to love it. It's a really, really great chat with him. But as Jill mentioned, y'all, we, it is not very long until we are actually going to have Real soccer to talk about this tournament. The MLS is back. That hasn't been played before. Kicking off, kicking off in Orlando on July eighth. We had oh my, you, I can't. You guys, this this draw last week. We did a live draw, and it about gave me a heart attack. I mean, being a part of this. Was, oh, it, it was so, you! I did mean, great. no, I didn't. I had. I didn't have as much pressure as Charlie Davies did, who was actually had to open executing the balls. the balls and had to like stuff them and put them in. Vanna but White. I was getting like nervous for him. Like he was going to not, if it were me, Jill, I would have knocked everything over. It would have been a disaster. Like, oh my God. Like it was so, it was so nuts to be a part of that. But I, the way it actually ended up like shaking out these groups. <gasps> I And it was not fixed people. Not fixed. There is no way this was fixed. I'm telling you, I literally watched Charlie Davies stuff these balls, these ping pong balls, write them myself, like with my own eyes. So it was not fixed in any way, shape or form, but holy moly, do we have some matchups to look forward to. So this is, uh, this is here for this guys. Cause we are so here for soccer. So here for soccer. So Jill, what of these, of these matchups that we've mm-hmm. seen in, in the groups, what are, which ones are, are you looking forward to the most? So group stages, we've got six groups. Um, the easy one, uh, I think you mentioned this too. The easy one being is El Trafico, right? That's the one everyone's looking at. And that's what we're going to talk to Sasha question about. Um, and I'm a little biased, sure, but I've really got my eyes on Atlanta's group with Atlanta United, the New York Red Bulls, the Columbus Crew, and Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Now, Atlanta's already beaten Cincinnati this year. They drew against them once last year and beat them once um, in 2019. But the Red Bulls, man, that is a triggering team and a triggering name oh, for yeah, this fan some- base. It's granted, I mean, on paper, it's a very different New York Red Bulls this year um, that has kind of given Atlanta United problems in the past. But also another team that's kind of got Atlanta United's number at times and can be that little like jab is the Columbus crew. Think about their first yeah. ever playoff series. They get knocked out of the knockout round in their inaugural season by Columbus. At, at Mercedes-Benz. At Mercedes-Benz at- Stadium. Now go fast forward a few years. Then I think I think back to most recently – in, in 2019, you know, Columbus came in with nothing, nothing to play for last year and, and beat Atlanta United la- late in the regular season. Um, Columbus was way out of the playoffs and Caleb Porter and co came in there and gave them problems and they get to see their old friend, Darlington Nagby. Uh, I think, I think this was as good of thing as things could have shaken out for Atlanta United, especially being that we knew Orlando and Miami, uh, were going to be in another group who is yours. Yeah. I mean, there's honestly, there are, there's a lot to choose from, right? Because we've got, um, uh, the hell is real Derby happening in group. Yes. In the Atlanta in, group. Yes. And then we've got, um, in group D there's like the RSL, we've got the Rocky mountain Derby with the RSL and Colorado Rapids, but the one, the one, in addition to El Trafico, which we will talk about, I promise. Um, 
Group C because we have the Canadian rivals, Toronto FC, I love that you and the Montreal one. Impact playing against each other. They are in Group C along with uh, the New England Revolution and DC United. And the reason why I love this so much is because having you know been a part of MLS and being a part of these rivalries, like you know, we talk about the the Cascadia rivalries, right between like the. Um, Portland Timbers and Seattle Sounders and you know that kind of gets a lot of attention and now LA and then the New York Derby the Canadian love to Canada. the Canadian rivalry these two teams and these two cities do not like each other they do not like each other I have watched some of these matches and it is spicy it is spicy and I think when you take this rivalry and you put it into this sort of World Cup style format I just think that 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 initial matchup is going to be so much fun to watch. There's going to be a lot of fire behind it. And I am really, really looking forward to it. I also, Toronto is one of my teams to watch in this tournament because they are a team that has historically, they know how to compete in these tournaments, right? They, they, they have proven that they can be successful in this format. And so I think Toronto is a team uh, to watch, but wouldn't it be interesting if Montreal came around and said, nah, not today. So not today. It's going to be it's going to be fun. We're so excited. We are so here for the return of soccer. Two other things that we're here for this week is the fact that the NWSL, uh the women's team soccer is the first professional um team sports team team sports team sports to be coming back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um but MLS, you know, is going to have a lot of eyes on it. So that opens up a lot of new MLS fans. Mhm. Indeed, it does. So a lot of people have been sort of, uh, you know, I've seen this a lot on social media where it's like, well, who should I support? Like, what team, what team should I get behind in this tournament? And this is great because there are going to be so many eyes, you know, people who have been just dying for for sports, live sports to watch. Uh, Now you have an even more, a bigger incentive to to watch MLS. And so I just want to put this out there that Jill and I are, we are so here for these conversations. And if y'all need any help in selecting a team, let us know. You can hit us up on Twitter at Susanna Collins, at Jillian Sakovitz. We can guide you into uh, you know, the, the right direction. Uh, we won't steer you wrong, I promise. So if you need a team, let us know. Someone we'll else you. now who can steer you in the right direction oh, yeah. is, um, I don't know, a casual NBA all-star. You may have heard of him before. Kevin Durant, oh, minority owner of now the Philadelphia Union. He bought a 5% stake. Uh, he joins other NBA guys like James Harden, Steve Nash, Magic Johnson. Good for the league. Woo, woo. So good for the league. So I have to say, too, um, I spoke to J.P. Della Camera earlier today, who is one of the voices of the, the Philadelphia Union, literally as this news was uh, being broken and, and being made official. And he said that he had been – he had talked to some people – when he found out that uh, Kevin Durant had shown up and they were having meetings and he was uh-huh. like, wait, what's, well, what's this about? Why is what's KD going there? On? Why is KD there? And apparently like these meetings lasted for a like, really, really long time. KD then like kept like showing up, like he would like come back and he, and he just, JP said, he was like, this is going to be the type of owner who is invested. Mm. He, you are going to see his face in the stands uh, or in the suites, let's be honest, more, <laughs> more realistically. But he is going to be a guy who really, really invests and cares and is, he knows, he knows, uh, you know, that he himself is a, is a selling point, right? Like Kevin Durant is a brand and he knows that his brand is strong. And so by implementing his brand into MLS, into the Philadelphia Union, it is only going to help. And now he's an investor. So it makes even more sense, you know? Well, so, I think Kevin Durant should bring his himself and his brand to the call up. Oh, I love it. I, I am. Listen, if we could get KD on this pod, what do you think? Mm-hmm. We got Sasha. I think we can get KD. I'm pretty sure we can get KD. All right. Well, time for another edition of Call Up Cares. And this one is so cool, Jill, especially considering everything that's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter movement and all the protests that we have been seeing. So 
U.S. men's national team and former Columbus Crew goalkeeper Zach Steffen, Zach Steffen, you guys, has launched a nonprofit to bring together the soccer community in the fight for justice and equality. Um, along with his former teammate, current Columbus Crew defender Alex Cronelli, and some other athletes, they created a GoFundMe to help black owned stores that have been affected during the protests, but then Mm -hmm. the stores have since encouraged the athletes to shift the focus to the fundraising to support um, black community, impoverished black communities, um, leading to the launch of the Voice Now Foundation. They are on Instagram. Um, I just followed them the other day. It's literally at Voice Now, but V-O-Y-C-E now. Yep. Voice and now. Instagram and Twitter. Instagram and Twitter. And they have raised oh, almost $45,000. Love it. Since this launched, which is so cool. He has just been, I mean, he literally set this up himself. And uh, with Alex. He's like and DM been, me. Like he's running it. Him and obviously other guys. But Yeah. So um, it's, very a, hands it's on. just a really, really cool initiative. And, you know, as much as Jill and I have been talking the last few weeks about just, you know, the social injustice that we see within the black communities and having these conversations and how we can help. Well, this is a way to help. And it, you know, the money is going directly to these impoverished black communities. So, um, yeah, check it out, get involved, donate if you can. And well done, Zach and Alex. Here for that, baby. Here for that. Well, we are so very pleased to be joined by midfielder for the LA Galaxy, a guy who has 52 caps for the U.S. men's national team, 11 seasons in MLS. Uh, He was drafted by Chivas in 2006, made his return to MLS in 2015, and now he is back in LA. Sasha Kleshin, we are thrilled, thrilled to have you on the call up today. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited. Sasha you know he's in California things, when he's outside, I know, outside, he's sitting right? outside. The sunshine is hitting him. So jealous. Um, first things first, you guys are back to full team training as of today. This is Monday when we're recording it. What was it like being back with uh, the entire squad? Uh, it was great. Uh, it was really nice to have a full team training session again today. Uh, just be on the field with everybody, you know, put in a few tackles, just get ourselves really ready for the Orlando tournament. So it felt really, really nice. It's, it was a long few months of running in the street in front of my house. (laughs) Not fun. A lot of fun today. We, we hear you. I mean, we got those (laughs) stories from everybody. Will Trapp trying to break into a park at 6am near his Miami home. I mean, everyone was doing what they could to make it work. All right. Now, with the Orlando tournament, we finally, we have dates, we have opponents, it's getting more real uh, with the MLS's back tournament. We have a group, the LA Galaxy is in the group, LAFC, Houston, and Portland. Group so F an is fire. L Trafico on the line. Uh, how has that helped kind of make it all feel a little bit more real now? Well, we all knew we were going to get LAFC, right? So, so it happened. Right, because we and- planned it that way. Yeah, I mean, it was fixed, right? Yeah, it was fixed. <laughs> Charlie um, Davies had uh, yeah, his magic. Know. I got to talk to Charlie. No, but um, I just had a feeling that would happen. And it's just going to be odd for me to play in my first Trafico, you know, down in Orlando <laughs> with no fans. And, you know, the fans provide so much in Derby games. They, yeah. they, they, they bring so much passion to those games. And, it, and those games always mean a little bit more for the fans, especially. I learned that a lot over my years, so... Uh, that will be interesting, but um, I'm really excited about the tournament. I'm excited to get down there and play. Um, you know, some, one of the things that brings me the most happiness in life is playing games. So I, I'm really excited. I think we're all excited and all ready to have actual games that matter yes, to talk ma'am. about. Um, you're no stranger to Orlando. And now, you know, you could be spending a, a significant amount of time there. When you think about you know, what it's going to entail, sort of, you know, you, you're going to be isolated within the compound at the hotel, maybe no team dinners really at restaurants. Mentally, what are the biggest challenges that you guys are going to face as a team in that situation? Well, you know, you get bored. It's like a preseason trip where you're away for two, three weeks. And uh, I think the sticking together with the guys, look, if, if we can just, you know, do things in the hotel to keep us busy. I know a lot of time is going to be spent alone. Guys are just going to be watching Netflix and stuff. Uh, Fortunately, you know, with technology these days, I'll be on FaceTime with my kids probably three or four times a day. 
And, and I think also probably spend that time being able to catch up with all the guys that I know throughout the league. And, you know, we're all in this thing together, so we're all going to be there for each other. And I think, uh, I think we're going to have a fine time. I think we'll be all right. That's the attitude I like to hear. I know. Thank I know. you. I know. Um, and for those positivity. of you saying we fixed it, um, <laughs> I'd like to just point out that it had to be the Western Conference. There's three groups, so there was a 33% chance that yeah. that there yeah. was that there were going to be some good matchups. Come okay, on, people. Now, if we fixed it, it would have been like Portland, Seattle, LA, LA. Right, exactly. But we'll throw some Houston in there. I mean, if anyone knows anything about the Orlando weather, it's those, <laughs> it's, it's them. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the way that the tournament is set up, World Cup style that helps bring it home for so many people. And I think it allows fans maybe outside of MLS to get involved because people are familiar with the World Cup style tournament. Um, and also there's not going to be anything else on. So it's a good opportunity, I think, for Major League um, Soccer and people who don't tend to watch soccer. Why do you think that the Galaxy uh, could be successful in, the, in this type of layout? Well, I think in, in any type of layout, we've got good players and we've got good coaching staff. And, and I think we're a good team. I think we've used this time to really come together as a group and support each other. Um, and then when we get down there, it's about who's going to get hot and who can stay hot you know, over, over a short period of time. So uh, I believe in our group. I believe in the guys that we have. We have a great mix of young and old and, and youth and experience. And, and I think we're going to need to count on a lot of people. So the team who, who usually can go the furthest is usually a team who can use some of their depth and use that depth to, to be successful. And I'm, I like the guys that we have. One of the things that we uh, we talked with the commissioner last week on the pod, and he went into a pretty you know great amount of detail about the safety protocols that are going to be in place down in Orlando for you guys, and it involves you know taking a test essentially like every couple of days. How do you feel in terms of of the safety measures that they're that they're instituting? Do you feel like this is going to be like? Do you feel comfortable as a player going down there? Do you feel like you're going to be safe? I feel comfortable, but I'm also a pretty optimistic guy. So mm-hmm. I believe that if the league is going to put on something like this, that they are going to go through all the proper protocols to be as safe as possible. Uh, and theoretically, if we stay in the bubble, we shouldn't have any infections on the inside. And so as long as guys are trustworthy and, and do what they're supposed to do and and can be professional for a few weeks, then I think we should be fine. So um, I'm not nervous. I'm not scared. I'm more excited than anything. You've made me even more excited just after a few minutes. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Maybe know. it's because we read such the heavy stuff over the last few weeks that this just feels like a breath of fresh air. All yeah. right. Let's not talk about the tournament first <laughs> for a second. MLS, don't get mad at us. Um, let's talk a little bit about you, uh, your family's heritage, your dad. Can you pronounce his name for us? Slavko. Slavko. Played yeah. professionally and was from Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, what brought the Kleshton family to Huntington Beach, California? That's where you were born and raised? Yeah, uh, my dad's got an interesting story. He actually snuck into the United States in the trunk of a car via Canada and hitchhiked his way down to L.A., <laughs> um, got to L.A., and then he didn't know like any English or anything and didn't know anybody, so he, he opened the phone book and started calling Serbian last names. That's how it and goes. Fi- finally, yes. Yeah, so it's like, you know, you get goosebumps because it's the American dream, right? He wow. came down here to, to do something. So he got in touch with a family who was from a town close by, uh, you know, to where he was from in Bosnia and, and uh, had a place to live for a few months and worked for the guy. And then a few years later, started his own business and, you know, met my mom at a nightclub. And, and uh, funny enough, I met my wife at a nightclub in Hollywood many, many years <laughs> later. So, um, it's in the blood. Yeah, I don't know. So, you know, they settled down. My mom grew up in Fountain Valley, which is the town next to Huntington Beach. And, you know, we settled there and lived there for a long time. Beautiful. That's wild. I yeah, love it. That's crazy. an incredible, that's an incredible story. Hitchhiking. It yeah, oh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, well, your MLS career uh, started in 2006. You were drafted by uh, Chivas and you had some like incredible teammates during the stretch from 06 to 2010. Brad Guzan, Jesse Marsh, Bob Bradley, Precky uh, were involved in that mix. What were some of your fondest memories from those early days in MLS? And you can be honest. Yeah. <laughs> my, I mean, I, I look back on my time with Chivas. I played there for four and a half years. And so every year we made the playoffs and we had really good teams. I, I had really good coaches. I got challenged a lot. 
I learned a lot from a lot of older guys. I always say that I was really lucky to, to step into a team that one needed a midfielder, which was what I provided. So I got to play a lot of games and I got to play a lot of games alongside a lot of older guys. So not only those guys you mentioned, but you know, three, three Mexican legends as well. So guys who also came up in a different part of uh, North America who, who grew up playing in a different league. I learned from Paco Palencia and Ramon Ramirez and Claudio Suarez just as much as I did from Jesse Marsh and Ante Razov. So I was pretty lucky. Um, I'm, it's really funny as I look back now. So now that we started our team training uh, back at the stadium, we are all divided up into different locker rooms because we all can't be in one locker room. So there's like sure. six guys per locker room. And I got put into the old Chivas locker room, which is now the Galaxy 2 locker room. Um, so like I set up my stuff in my same seat that I used to sit in 15 years ago, like the showers still look the same. They haven't been remodeled yet. Like the rest of the, the galaxy first team locker room has been. So it's, it's, it's crazy to me, like to, to be back here now, 15 years later and, and looking back on that time, I, I love my time with Chivas. You've literally come full circle. Yeah, it's crazy. That yeah, is so I feel cool. like you said, you say full circle so many times in your career, right? When you came back and played with Red Bulls, it's like, Okay, Sasha's gone full circle. Now it's like, yeah. could it get? I mean, maybe if I you know. end up coaching in 20 years, it'll be more yeah, full circle. Yeah, I know. I know, right? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, let's talk a little bit about Jesse Marsh. Uh, you mentioned him among some of the guys you got to play with. Uh, your teammate, obviously, at Chivas, but then goes on to be your coach at the New York Red Bulls. He's now over at Salzburg. What type of impact did he have on your career? And what was your relationship like um, with him? I know, you know, Jesse Marsh has been very outspoken. He's been a trailblazer of sorts for MLS. And we'll get to it in a minute. And I know, you know, you've been outspoken about social matters and everything going on right now with Black Lives Matter. Yeah, no, Jesse is one of the people uh, in my life, I think, that has been a a huge influence on me um, over my career. So I, I met him when I was 20. I think he was probably 32 um and we played so the last four years of his career were the first four years of my career and we Mm. played in the midfield together almost every game and so I learned a lot from him then I gotta say it's funny the first year I hated Jesse like I I just (laughs) I didn't like him he he was always hard on me because we were partners in the midfielder in in the midfield and he always wanted the best out of me he always wanted to challenge me because I think he saw that I had some talent and and he wanted to help nourish me and uh, nurture me so uh I hated him. And then after that, the second year, I, I, I just like, I figured him out and I realized who he was and how helpful he was. And then I loved him. And so we remained close. And then we always kept in touch when I played in Europe. And then, you know, his family went on a trip around the world after he was fired from Montreal and they went around the world for six months. And, and he was supposed to come visit me in Belgium for uh, like a day and a half. But his kids were so excited because I had this big, nice apartment. I had a swimming pool. So his kids were so happy to finally like sleep in a big bed and hang out with me and my wife and our dog. And the car that they were using broke down when oh. he arrived at my place in Belgium. So he ended up staying for a week while like the, <laughs> the car had to be fixed. And and during that week, it was the last week of the season, and we won the title. So he was there for like my last three games of the season. He watched oh, me wow. win. Yeah, he watched me win the title, and he, he he came out and partied with us, like with my whole team that night, and celebrated. And in the meantime, he used that time to meet with my coaches and talk to them about mm-hmm. coaching and all that stuff. And then, you know, a few years later, when he got the New York job, he he gave me a call and said I was the first player he wanted to sign, and wow. and I was all for it. I you know, having gone to school in New Jersey and 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 loving New York city and, mm-hmm. and always wanted to play there again. It, it was really awesome that, that he brought me over. Did he cook uh, anything while he was staying at your house? Yeah. Was um, he a good house guest? They were great house guests actually. <laughs> of course they uh, were. Yeah. They're, that's just, they're an awesome family. They got a bunch. It's funny seeing their kids now, like their daughter's about to graduate high school and, oh, and, wow. and go to college in Europe. And you know, she was, this was 2012 probably. It was a long time ago. So um, and I've seen, I, I knew them, I met him when they only had two kids and then they had the third. So it's, it's crazy to see how we've all grown and, and, and they're just good people. It was a really fun trip to have them there. It's such a cool evolution, your relationship with him, how he was there from the beginning. And then, you know, yeah. all this, then he was your coach, uh, at, New York Red Bulls. And this was, I mean, the, your time at New York Red Bulls, you are so beloved here in this city, Sasha. Like every time I'm at Red Bull arena, I see like question jerseys everywhere. I mean, and you, you had some of your best seasons in, in MLS wearing 
a Red Bulls jersey. What do you feel? I look back, when I look back at like the Red Bulls teams, I go back to that 2015 roster, the team that won the Supporter Shield that year. And I look at that, like you're starting 11. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, yeah. it, it's just something special about that team. What are your fondest memories of that particular time or just your time in, in New York? Well, I mean, I loved I loved every minute of my time in New York. Um, first of all, the city is such a special place. I've always wanted to live there and, and, and to be there for, for three years and, and just experience what New York City has to offer, you know, is, is amazing. Then on the soccer side, we had such a good team. I loved playing at Red Bull Arena. Um, I loved being with the guys every day. The group of guys that we had, the, you know, those, those kind of teams don't come together uh, so often in soccer where you really – yeah. gel and mesh with guys that are, are almost like friends for life. And so I still keep in touch with a bunch of them. We still all text. We still play fantasy football together. So <laughs> yeah, it's it, that was a, a really special time in my career and my life. And I, I really, I cherish like every moment I got with New York Red Bulls. Amazing. Prior to New York Red Bulls, um, let's take a step back for just a second. So Chivas USA, then you go to Europe. Uh, you have a standout career with Anderlecht in Belgium's first division. Uh, in an interview I listened to, you said in Belgium, you know, that was like playing for the Lakers. Uh, so two questions, just how would you describe that pocket of time of, of being different than what you experienced in MLS? And since your return to MLS, do you think that playing for a team like the LA Galaxy or for the New York Red Bulls that you're becoming more like not the Lakers, but maybe closer to becoming like the way that the MLS teams have long wanted to, to be respected and in the newspapers and, and things like that in their, in, in big cities, especially big sports cities. Well, I must say that in Europe, the LA galaxy is by far the most famous team. Uh, I think obviously David Beckham is the huge uh, piece of that Why him coming over and playing for the galaxy just made it into a worldwide brand. So so people know the LA Galaxy in Europe. That that's for sure. Playing for Anderlecht was, uh, was amazing. The, the, you know, that's it, it's it was such a beautifully run family club. So so think about this: the biggest club in the country, the most successful club in the country by far. It had had been run by one family for like seventy five years. You know, it was the grandfather was the president, then his son, and then his son, and so. Um, I got there and there, you know, there's people that work for the club that were in their sixties and seventies and they had worked for the club since they were in their twenties. Like the, the Anderlecht was their life. Like this, this was, it was so special to play for a team that meant so much to so many people in the country. And so the country is really small, but if you left Brussels, you know, where Anderlecht is and you went up to Antwerp for the weekend or something, which is 45 minutes away, but they've got their own, they've got three teams in Antwerp. But, but Anderlecht was still the most popular team. And so you got recognized everywhere you went. The people, the people loved you if, you were, if they were an Anderlecht fan. Um, and then you just have the pressure of, of, of trying to win a championship every year. So every season you're playing, if you, if you don't win the championship, the season is a failure. So the pressure, the pressure that gets yes. put on you. And, and, and then when you win, the, the feeling of, of accomplishment and what we all went through together for a whole season, it was, it was just such a special time in my life. It's so cool. It's just a, your soccer journey has been, has been a pretty remarkable one. And, you know, now you find yourself back, back in LA, back in your hometown with the galaxy in your mind, was this kind of the path that you had wanted? Like if you could like draw it up and like end up where you are right now, back in LA, close to family, is this kind of how you envisioned it going? Yeah. Um, while also saying, I don't think I'm super close to the end of my playing career yeah, I, I still not. feel really good and so you know at my age it, it you know a lot of my friends and guys that are younger than me have retired already so uh, <laughs> but I feel really good physically uh, I feel great mentally and yeah I'm really excited because I grew up a Galaxy fan so mm -hmm. I, I grew up at the perfect time when MLS was starting I was 11 12 years old when the league started I got to watch the Galaxy play you know on local TV and my parents would take us up to the Rose Bowl to watch you know Kobe Jones and all those guys so um, to be back here, you know, my brother works for the club too. So LA galaxy has kind of become a second family to mm. me over the years. You know, when I, even when I played in Europe, my brother was working for the galaxy. And so I would come home for the summers back to Southern California. And every weekend I would just go up to the galaxy game and sit in the suite with him, with the guys and watch the game. And, you know, they've always been friendly with me and they always allowed me to train in their stadium when I was home for the summers and stuff like that. So to be back, it feels like a family here and it feels really nice. 
uh, two we're not, questions. We're not, we're not sending you to early retirement, Sasha. <laughs> no, yeah. don't worry. We, no, don't worry. we want to. We want to see. Good you luck out on there this for show. A, a very long max, time. Yeah, long careers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't had Jeff Lorenowitz. Now that I think about no, that, we, we talk him. about the elders, but we've had Brad Gazan. He's still going. Um, Tim Howard. <laughs> went, <laughs> um, okay, two things. Uh, fan question sets up perfectly. Miss Pamela Garcia. She wanted to know who are your top three favorite galaxy players growing up. And then my own question is, what did your brother do for the galaxy? My brother's title is, uh, I think it's director of soccer operations. So he works closely with the Ovon Kirovsky and, and the general manager, Dennis DeClosa. Uh, so it's great. I, 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 you know, him and I are best friends. We played in college together. Um, you know, we're as close as two people can be. He lives a mile from here. We, we see him every day. He's awesome. Uncle Gordon to my kids. My kids are obsessed with him. So it's been awesome to see him every day now when, when I didn't see him, you know, three, four times a year for, for the past 10 years. Um, favorite Galaxy players going up to get to your question. Uh, Mauricio Cienfuegos was first um, and is probably number one on the list. Um, I think a, a, a good one is Kevin Hartman because, you know, he, he – He's like, he's El Gato, you know, he was the goalie. And then I've gotten to know him over the years now too. And like my friends who like aren't soccer players, they know who El Gato is like from Southern uh -huh. California. So uh, Kevin Hartman's a great shout, Kobe Jones. Um, and then I got to think like, you know, you know, who's a great undercover shout? Chris Armas played for the LA Galaxy oh, for the first two there years. We go. And he's like the best guy ever. And yeah, what a yes. great coach he was in New York. And I love that guy. So oh. those are, he only played there two seasons and he's much, much remembered as a, a Chicago fire. Oh, well, but, I'm, I'm from Chicago, Sasha. Yeah. So Chris, I'm a, I'm a big Chris Armas fan. So yeah. he just warmed, warmed yeah. my, my heart with that one. Um, one of the things that Jill kind of mentioned it earlier, um, you know, you have been really, outspoken in your support for the Black Lives Matters movement and everything that's kind of going on in the world right now with systemic racism and the fight against it and the fight for, for social justice. You posted some pictures on, on Instagram. You took your family to one of the protests. You had your wife, your two kids there. Why was that important for you to be a part of that and to show your support? Well, First and foremost, I, I just think it was important that we as white people begin the conversation of, of what this country has, has done to black people for mm -hmm. 400 years. Um, and then I wanted to be on the right side of history. I think my wife and I talked about it and we, we, we said to each other, what are we going to tell our kids when they, sorry, I'm getting emotional. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are we going to tell our kids when they get a little bit older and ask these questions about what we did in 2020 and we wanted to we wanted to be there and we wanted to protest with the people because i'm sorry no it's what's what's happened in our incredible. country is not fair and we need change and we don't want to see protests all the time but they were necessary and and it was so necessary because it, it, it makes me feel ashamed that, that I didn't know enough about this. Sorry. No. Jill and I have had that conversation on this. Yeah, that we need to pod. we need to be better and that we were too late, we were behind, and we were embarrassed by our own like so much we had to catch up on on a few weeks that we were just calling each other back and forth, back yeah. and forth of what'd you read? Oh yeah. I'll send that to you. And, and then I'm catching up and I feel like I've done so much and I'm like, you're still behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you, no, you, that's that, that part's very important. And I think these yeah. conversations are very important. And I think that's the, the whole point of everything that, that I was so overwhelmed and frustrated by what was happening and not, fully understanding the systemic racism that has plagued our country for so long. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we have to do everything that we have to do. Like I, I thought about it today on my way to training. What would I feel like if I lived in my neighborhood here and I was black and how would I feel just walking around every day being judged? And, and, and I never thought of that before. And I, and I'm embarrassed to say that, but yeah. I thought about it today and it made me so sad and angry and like, like it, enough is enough, you know? So I don't know. We got to 
could not. We got to we got to do what we got to do to make changes. Well, we do, and you're right. And these conversations amongst amongst white people is really important, so that we are. I mean, Jill, like I've, I've you know, it's I've been calling it, referring it to this, like this reckoning with my whiteness, you know. And as you say, and like I live in I live in Brooklyn, and it's a, a, a diverse place. And I same thing. I was going for a walk, and I'm like, never once have I had to worry about like putting a hoodie on, yeah. walking into a a you know convenience store at night you know like it's just like you yeah. you're the the blinders are up and so i think like the more that we can the more that we can talk about it and just become aware is is part of the problem right and we're just yeah. like scratching the surface and one of the things that i thought was so cool um was that you did bring your kids you know to this like you are exposing and they're and they're still young how vera and is it uh what's Knox? Yeah, my, my daughter's six vera yes. and Knox is three yeah so Knox didn't really know what was going on but my yeah. daughter we talked to her about it ahead of time and, and i think she understood and and i think it's important for them to see that that we support everybody and that Absolutely. we're we talk about it all the time we, we have lots of books that we read to them at night that are just about equality and 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 you know just Everybody is the same. And so that that's the message we've been trying to send them in the last few days, last few the, weeks. Yeah. Uh, I had I, this picture up of uh, the sign that says, yeah. I'll walk, I'll yes. walk with you. And I thought that was just like one of the most beautiful that brought tears to my eyes when I, when yeah. I saw that, I thought it was just such a, it's such a beautiful, a beautiful message. So earlier that week, my daughter had been chosen to pick a book to read to her class over zoom. And that was the book that she picked. And it's, it's just a message of equality that we're all the same. And, yeah. and it, it just fit perfectly in that time. So she, she said she wanted to, to cut off the book cover and put it up on her sign for uh, the day. So it was awesome. I have goosebumps. Kids awesome. are in so many ways, like the best examples right now, because yeah. they don't have, like we say, Oh, we feel, you know, we feel like we didn't do enough. We feel stupid, you know, cause we, our brains need to be remolded. Yeah. And we need to get ourselves up to speed, but like they still don't know anything. So like they really are the difference. So then I think like I've had friends who are like, if you guys had kids, what would you be saying to them this and that? I'm like, they're going to pick up on what you do. So I think yeah. you bringing them to a protest is like just putting them so much further ahead to be able to make life better for other people and to be more open-minded when they're our age. I think it's great. I mean, who do they imitate? They imitate their parents. And yeah. Yeah. I got to say, I've been very ex inspired by the people that are much younger than me that are leading a lot of these movements. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a, a big protest here near where I live uh, last weekend that was led by two high school seniors. And, oh, and there, were yes. thou there were thousands of people that, that walked. And, it's awesome. and, and, and my little sister, I got to say, she, I mean, little, she's she's 29. She lives in San Francisco, but you know, she's the office manager for, for a company. And she put together a whole list of, of black businesses in their neighborhood and, and podcasts to listen to and books to read. And, 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 you know, she forwarded it to our whole family and stuff. So I've just been, you know, I've been very inspired by the younger people and the younger generation. And, and the, you know, that's, what's going to carry us hopefully for the next 50, 60 years. Sasha, one of the questions I have for you too, is that like, you know, as we as we are, you know, sort of coming, you know, really educating ourselves with this and becoming more aware of the struggles and the oppression that black people have had to face for so long, you know, soccer's coming back, right? Like you guys are going to report to Orlando. We're going to have games to talk about. How do we continue to keep this conversation front and center, even as things slowly start to return to normal in a, a sporting busy. a sporting sense. Yes. How do we how do we keep this going and all this hard work? How do we continue it? Well, I'm glad you said it. I think it's very important that we do keep this conversation going. Um, it's already been weeks now and, and and things don't seem to be slowing down. So that's a very good sign as hopefully we we progress to to lots of change. Um, I think the players are, are all on the same page here. And I yeah. think we're all excited to use our platform. And so I would hope after every game, the guy who scores the goal and the guy who gets interviewed after the game keeps this conversation going. You know, yeah. the, I think the conversation will, will naturally always talk about soccer. This is our life and our passion. But as people, I think we always have to use our platform to, to continue to push for change. And um, I think the conversation will continue as we get to Orlando. And then even then we're all going to be staying in the same hotel and we're all going to be together. So I, I hope we're, we're all going to get together on the same page and show some, some unity as that, that we're all pushing for change together. 
really looking forward to that and makes me proud to be part of MLS where it does seem like so many people are on the same page. Okay. You've mentioned your wife, your wife and your two kids. You guys went to the protest together. We see your adorable pictures on Instagram. Um, So we did a little research. Uh, Your model wife, Jamie Lynn, she was a part of the 2009 Victoria's Secret fashion show model search. So we have to know, like, what's the love story? (laughs) How did you guys meet? Sorry to pivot, but like, it's on our minds. Uh, it's Jamie Lee, actually. Um, what I say? So I didn't say I Jamie. You Lee? said Jamie Lynn. Oh, sorry, okay. Jamie Lee. Um, so we met in a nightclub at the on nightclub her, on her twenty first oh, yeah, on her twenty first birthday <gasps> in Hollywood. Um, I used to go out with a couple guys on my team, you know, once a week or so, and I believe it was a Monday night, <laughs> and we met on the dance floor, and she had a. Uh, she, she was like, hey, it's my birthday. And I was like, cool. And she's like, let me show you my ID. And I was like, no, nah, it's okay. I believe you. <laughs> and then she like went to show me her ID and she had lost it. And she was like looking around for it. And I'm like, oh. okay, I'll be over there with my friends if you find it. And come find me later. And so whatever. We hung out. We met. We, we exchanged numbers. And pretty much the rest is history. We started dating a week later. And yeah, we got married in 2012. And tomorrow is our uh, eight-year wedding anniversary. Aww. Congratulations. So the right. episode will be released. Happy anniversary, Happy Thank anniversary. You. from us to Sasha you. and Jamie Lee. Okay, Thank so you. what's the what's the secret, Sasha? How do you how do you, how do you keep it fresh and and passionate and all that? What how what what's the secret? I don't know what the secret is. I, I don't we just we we love being around each other and I think oh. we're best friends and we we share everything with each other. I, I've, I've done this since pretty much the week I met her, that every day on my way home from training, I call her right when I leave training and we chat for five minutes and tell her, she asks how my day was, how was training. I tell her a little bit about it. If I'm frustrated or something, usually the, the, the conversation will last a little bit longer where she has to listen to me vent about what went wrong in training. But um, we've got our routine and we've stuck together. We've been all over the world. We've lived in some amazing places. And I don't know. I just, I think we, I think we share everything with each other. We don't keep anything from each other and we just enjoy being best friends and being together. Well, happy anniversary. I know. Love it. That's awesome. All right. Well, we will let you go right after this quick game that we have. Um, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> to celebrate your anniversary, we have a game for you. Um, we have a segment on the show called Here for This, things that we're into and not into. But this is called Hair for This. I think okay. you know where this is probably going. Um We're going to play a game where we're going to show you former teammates, managers of yours, and it's going to be who has rocked your epic signature stash better. But we have to know where did the signature stash come from? Because we can't find a picture of you without it. We went back to 2013. Yeah, we were after 2013. So I I think it started in 2013. It might have been 2012. I was playing for Anderlecht, and we had played, I think, three games in a week, and I hadn't shaved. And we won all three games. And so I said, okay, I'm going to wait until we lose or tie a game and then I'll shave it off. And we, we won like 11 straight games. And then we went on winter break where we, I got to fly home to California for a week and then to come back. And then like two weeks later, the season starts up again. And then we finally, we had gotten to 13 wins in a row, no draws, no losses, which this like never happens. Yeah. Right. right. And then we finally tied a game and I was like, I don't know. I feel like I look kind of cool. I'm like, I don't know. I kind of like it. So ever, ever since then it, it has stuck. And then every once in a while I'll shave it all off just Mm -hmm. for the hell of it. Cause it'll come back like in a week or two. And then every time I do it, I've done it like twice in the last four years probably. And my wife is just like, you just don't look the same. It's It's your signature look. And I mean, Orlando's going to need it. This is an uh, an appreciation of of the question yes. stash. Just so Thank you know, you. like we are Thank we're you. we're huge fans. I am a I am a, a little bit obsessed with like soccer hair, yeah, facial hair. Like I just you know through the ages, I'm so into it. You so have, this is if, if, to be a cool soccer player, you have to have cool hair. So right. I mean, like it's a just prerequisite. Like, exactly. So we uh, <laughs> in this vein, we have this little game where we we've taken some of your your former teammates and coaches, and we have superimposed the question oh, stash oh, you. on them. On and them. then you are going to tell us who you think rocked it better. Okay. Cause this is, a, this is all, all about this you is an, and the this stash. This is an important game. This is a really important game. This is hard. This is an important stuff. podcast. Let me tell you. All right. So let's kick it off with our first, our first set here. We've got Jesse. Oh man. <laughs> Jesse Marsh or Bob Jesse Bradley. Marsh or Bob Bradley. Oh. 
Oh, uh, I mean. Wow. It's too dark. It's too dark on Bob's face. This is yeah. hilarious, though. This is really funny. So I got to go with Jesse. I think he looks pretty good. He looks a little mean. He looks like he could be French. I was just going to say, he looks very European. The scar. Yeah. And he has the so scar. Jess, Jesse wins that one. Okay. I don't think I've ever seen Bob look like more than <laughs> more than six hours of scruff grown on his face. It's Honestly, like even seeing, like, I, I was looking back and seeing Bob, even with, like, a little bit of hair on top is, is very odd. So, is. yeah, he's just, you know, the clean-shaven guy. All right, up next, goalkeepers, Luis Robles or Brad Gazan? <laughs> oh, man. I like Brad. Oh, I'm going Luis. Like <laughs> okay, so I don't even think Brad can grow a mustache. There's this, there's this, <laughs> okay, it looks better on Luis, I got to say. That's for the sure. Better Brad got put into a wager when he played for Aston Villa with some of you. If you ever get him on again, you have to ask him where they, they bet him a bunch of money that he couldn't shave for like three months. And he had this like long beard. It was so gross, oh, but no that. mustache at all. <laughs> oh so it, no! It, yeah, you have to Google oh. Brad Gazan and try to find an old photo of that. All right, next up we have Aaron Long oh. or Rolf Felcher. Oh, it's so wide on Aaron's face. I know, I know. Oh, uh, I don't know. Rolf looks pretty good. Like Rolf looks like. He looks stylish. Aaron does not look very good. Aaron, no, don't don't copy me, Aaron. That's, that's Aaron. Cool. Aaron can you know make his statement on top of his head. You know he, he rocks he that like that mullet. like the mo- the Mohawk mullet thing, whatever that. He's it's got it all going his, on in the back. Every time yeah, he has the he mullet, the Aaron's very close with me and my wife because when when he was like a rookie in New York, he was from California and we were from California, so he spent a lot of time at our house. And Aww. It, he would bring his laundry over on Sundays. My wife would like make him meals. And so whenever he does something stupid to his hair, we always like FaceTime him. Like, what are you Give doing? Him. And he, but yes. his, his mom loves it. And his mom is always supporting. I'm like, what's wrong? I'm like, yes. So I like he text told with me his that. mom. His mom sometime. comes like, up with the with ideas. No, yeah, she's no, wild. She's it's, crazy. It's... She's the best. All right. We got two more for you. Nani or Dax McCarty. <laughs> oh, oh. Dax looks awesome, actually. He looks tough. Like that's, he looks like an old German midfielder that would, that would yes. if you dribble past him. So I gotta yes. go with Dax. That's my boy. Dax does look. He looks fierce in that picture. I like that one. He does. Okay, last one. BWP oh, or Chicharito? Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, Brad looks like he's about fifty years old. In that it picture. ages that, him. That it does. Up. Oh, so I love old. it. And Cheech just looks angry. I got to go with BWP. That's my guy also. We'll give it to Brad. Oh, it's amazing. Well, this is just, this is what it would look like. This is what Sasha looks like without the stash. Oh, my God. No, I, honestly, I wouldn't even recognize you, Sasha. <laughs> that is how iconic the mustache is. That's like maybe when I retire, I'll shave it if I want to be <laughs> unrecognizable. But just, I walk yeah. around. I, I got a funny story about the mustache. I was in Washington, D.C., um, for a game against DC United. And I walked across the street to this bakery, like the, right when we got in and I wanted to like get a croissant or something. And the guy, I was wearing my Red Bulls gear. And the guy <laughs> said to me, man, you, you look like this soccer player from New York, man, this guy with the mustache. And I was just like, Oh yeah. I thought he was joking because oh I thought God. I'm like, clearly it's, I'm standing in front of you. Yeah. And he's like, that's crazy, man. That's, that's crazy. You look just like him. I was like, Oh yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, and then like a minute later, he was like, dude, I, you look, you look so much like this guy. It's crazy. And I'm like, Oh, are you a soccer fan? And he's like, no, no, no. Like I'm not a big soccer fan, but like all my friends like soccer and they, they like this guy with the mustache. They think he's good, but like, I don't know. I, I don't watch soccer, so I don't know, but you look so much like him. This and I was amazing. like, I'm like, I'm him, dude. It's me. What yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. He wouldn't believe me. I'm like, I'm wearing New York Red Bulls gear. Like, literally. I'm the guy. Oh, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. Did he take very, a, did it was very he, funny. Did he end up like ever taking like a selfie with you yeah, or something he so he could like, show let's, friends? Let's okay. take a picture so he can show my friends. I'm like, yeah, tell them how You're weird, like, no, how weird this interaction was. This is me. That's wild. That's yeah. a really, really funny story. Yes. Well, on that note, we oh. love that. And we thank you so much. This- oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Guys, that's what happens in home stuff. My light just, just fell down. We just broke some kitchenware. We, we broke. Just broke some lighting. No, it's not broken. It's just fine. But we thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. This has me even a little more ready yeah. for Orlando. I hope and you're thank, more ready for Orlando. And too. thank you. Thank you for just being so real and uh, using your voice and putting it out there because it's mm-hmm. it's so important and you're doing such a, an incredible job. So um, keep doing it. Stay safe in Orlando. We can't wait to see you back on the pitch, thank, Sasha. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. And, and I appreciate you asking some real questions. Where you know It's the first time I've talked about it publicly. Um, 100%. So, yeah, we continue to, to push for change and, and make sure I think the voting is important. So I don't think I mentioned that. So yes. regis- register to vote and, and, you know, try to make the difference any way you can. But thank you guys for having me. Love it. Thanks, Thanks for coming on, Sasha. Wow. <gasps> this has me feeling even more excited than I already was him sending us all the fields. Feels as he said, like having meaningful conversations, yeah. but also talking soccer again. Mm-hmm. I, I I am really, pumped. I loved what he said, Jill, about the way he wants to kind of keep this conversation going, especially when games are back. You know, and how he yep. wants to see guys, you know, in the way in the way they celebrate or you know address it in their post game. You know what this views. tells me? Guys are really talking right now. Yes, and that is that's one of the coolest coolest things to hear because it it is it's all about continuing these conversations yeah. and keeping it out there. So I think Sasha is going to be one of those guys to do it and just sounds very- like most if not all players in MLS, which makes me very very proud. And I'm- very proud. And we'll find out more from whoever we talk to next week. So we'll I see you know, then. guys, thank you so much for watching and listening. Download, subscribe, and please, hey, give us a give us a little review. While yes, you're please. At it. <laughs> thank you. Plug. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Love you guys. Mwah.